Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you this Labor Day weekend. I know we have several people out of town traveling, uh, but it is good to have you all here with us uh, worshiping this morning. And if you would, join with me and let us pray this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you so very much for your goodness. We thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray that this morning as we are uh, coming into this place of worship, it would be with expectant hearts. Lord, knowing that uh, you desire us to be in company with you, that we might consider the deeper things of eternity, that we might consider the deeper things of worship, that we might consider the deeper elements of what it looks like to live a surrendered life to you. What does it look like to lay things at your feet as an eternal king? What does it look like when we sing songs to an eternal king, how might that reverberate not only in this room, but also for eternity? God, as we worship this morning, what does it look like to take burdens that are heavy on our hearts and to lay them at your feet? To be able to take the battles and the sin and the things that we're struggling with and to lay them at your feet or to even look into the deeper recesses of our heart and the things that we perhaps are not sure we want to lay at your feet, the things that we are held up by and hung up by, that each of us has those deep recesses in our hearts where it's easy to go through motions and worship. It's easy to show up and sing songs and to hear a message and, and to praise you and to thank you All the while, there's still parts of our heart that are tucked away, and we're saying, but not this yet, Lord. What does it look like for us to open our hearts and to say, okay, Lord, here you go. I surrender this to you as well. Lord, let us live surrendered lives. Allow us to have the humility of worship this morning to know that you don't need us. We need you. And that when we come before you, in song, in worship, as we listen, as we engage with our mind, as we engage with our heart, that this is a full person opportunity. And so, God, I pray that you would speak into our lives as only you can. I pray that you would be with Bub as he brings the message this morning. God, I pray that you would be with our teens as they are on the retreat this weekend. Uh, Lord, all, I think it's 24 of them. Uh, Lord, that you would work in their lives, open their eyes and their ears, be with the adults, Lord, as they minister, not only to the teenagers, but to one another. I pray, Lord, that there is rich worship where they are. And so, God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for this place. And I thank you for the work that you're doing, that you've done and are going to continue to do. We pray these things in your amazing name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Man, let's stand and sing. Yeah. 
Amen. Bow with me in prayer, if you would. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at your word together, to come before you as a group, praising you and learning from you. And we pray now that as we uh, look into your word, that you just teach us what you would and have us be responsive. And then your will would be done in our lives, Lord. And we just thank you for all the blessings you've given us through your precious son's name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, if you're visiting today, welcome on behalf of Bethany Church. And uh, we're wrapping up our series today, finishing it up on the book of Revelation, the first five chapters, not the whole book, but we're going to finish up today with chapter five. So our task is meaty in front of us, but we will get through it somehow. Uh, the last few, uh, actually a couple months, uh, Pastor Christian has graciously given up his pulpit uh, to Eric, Buddy, Roger, and myself to share in preaching this series, and I really do uh, trust it's been a blessing to you as it has to us. Uh, like I said, last time I preached, when uh, you're the one doing the uh, sermon, you're the one that's learning the most, so it's been a real blessing to me. Uh, and uh, just so you know, last week, if you hopefully you were here, uh, Roger gave a uh, pop quiz at the start. And of course, I'm not that cruel. And uh, <laughs> I do want to sympathize with you. I only got one right myself, and I think I missed the one that I said. So, <laughs> so don't feel bad if you missed more than one. Um, have you thought about heaven? I think we all have. When we think about heaven, many of us... Uh, think about who we're going to see, who we're going to talk to, who we're going to ask questions of. And I have a theory on that I'm going to run by you today. I think the person that's going to get the most questions is Noah. Like, why and how? Why did you bring mosquitoes? <laughs> Followed closely by, why did you bring fleas? And ticks, uh, dogs especially might ask them that, or rats, except for those few that work in labs, I don't see much value in rats, personally. Also, Noah, how? How did you survive, how did the ark survive the two termites? <laughs> you know, it must have been God really protecting the ark. And did you really start and finish with two rabbits. <laughs> I'll just leave that out there. Since the teenagers are gone, I thought I could, I thought I could do an R-rated joke. <laughs> so I really think he might be bar bombarded with questions, but really, maybe not. But the title of today's message is a question that is asked in heaven, and we see the actual words uh, in our text today. And our title is, Who is Worthy? That's a real question that's going to be asked today. Um, before we get started in the sermon, uh, I'm going to be presenting some thoughts, and it'll even show up a little bit on slides, on my view of the um, end times. And that is not everybody's view, and I respect that, and I'm not trying to convince anybody. Uh, there's basically three views of the millennium, which is a thousand year uh, period of time described in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, that I don't want to get too technical, we don't have time to go into that today, but there's uh, pre-millennial, there's post-millennial, and there's ah-millennial. And those uh, just mean uh, that the rapture of the church is going to take place before the millennial kingdom. The post-millennial thinks it's going to take place, or the second coming of Jesus is going to take place after the millennium. And then a millennial thinks there is no millennial kingdom, that the kingdom is on earth right now. So whatever you might have believe or know or understand on that is okay. We're all going to end up in the same place if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, one other uh, housekeeping uh, or uh, knowledge-helping uh, uh, phrase I want to use is describing number seven. 
in the Bible, throughout the Bible, seven is the number of completion or perfection. So keep that in mind. I'm going to say seven a bunch of times today. So keep that in mind that that's God's way of saying completion or perfection. Uh, the past few weeks as we've studied this, we know that the uh, book of Revelation is written by the Apostle John, the one who Jesus loved deeply. He gave him this special gift of being the Apostle to write this revelation. And he wrote also the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the book of Revelation. And he was the uh, last man standing, you might say. He was the last Apostle alive. Uh, and he was uh, living on a uh, island of Patmos. Uh, all the other apostles had been uh, martyred. Revelation is a vision that John has. We see that described from chapter 1 on. And he's taken us on a fantastic journey. And the rest of the book also will be that way too. And he's told to record all that he sees in the vision. <coughs> and then to distribute this uh, book or what he's written back to the seven churches. And in uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, let me flip back there, 119, I'm sorry. He says, Therefore write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things that will take place after these things. So the things seen basically are in chapter 1, the things that are, are chapters 2 and 3. Those are the things that we've been studying about the churches. And then the things that are after began in last week's sermon, chapter 4, and continue through the end of the book. In fact, he opens chapter 4 with after these things. And uh, for those of us who believe in a future uh, seven-year tribulation, uh, the after these things, uh, the book could be outlined, the after these things, chapters 4 through 22, and then uh, 4 and 5, which we're wrapping up today, will be before the tribulation, chapter 6 through 19, describe the tribulation, then uh, chapters 20 through 22 are after the tribulation, when God's kingdom comes to earth. Chapters 4 and 5 are closely tied together, both are set in heaven, and both describe worship. As Brother Roger pointed out last week, John is in the throne room of heaven. We're still there today in our, cha in our chapter, in chapter 5. G John is describing what he sees and what he hears in heaven. The 24 elders are people, and I believe they are the church that has been raptured. There's also four living creatures there. Uh, which have eyes to see things the way that God sees them, and they also continually praise God. Um, chapter 4, as we saw last week, de perfectly describes worship. Uh, in verse 9, it says, And when the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. So worship is to give honor and glory and thanks to God, Him that sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. It's an acknowledgement of who He is, His majesty, His power, and His glory. In chapters 4 and 5, we see the description of events in heaven. Chapter 6 on, through the end of the Revelation, we see things that are happening on earth. Through John's writing, we are granted access to the uh, throne room of heaven. And if, uh, I want to ask you guys a question again now. If I ask you to close your eyes, and I'm not saying close your eyes, but picture Jesus, uh, what image comes to your mind? What image of Jesus comes to your mind? We all have an image of Jesus, I believe. Do you see him as a baby in a manger? Do you see him talking with little children? Do you see a picture of him passing out bread and fish to the multitudes? Or maybe you see him healing diseases, curing uh, the incurable diseases of his day, restoring sight to a blind person. Or maybe you see Jesus up on the cross, his beaten, bloody body, stating to the thief beside him, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
or maybe you see him outside the tomb consoling a despondent, uh, distressed Mary by just saying her name, Mary, at the tomb because he was resurrected. One of my favorite images is in Acts 1, uh, his final appearance on earth at that time was his ascension. Uh, Jesus is talking to his followers, telling them, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea and Samaria and all the earth. Then, all of a sudden, he takes off into a cloud, into the sky, into a cloud. Can you imagine being there? What? Uh, no jetpack, no nothing. He just takes off. And then two angels come up and they say, Men of earth, why are you looking into the heaven? Well, did you just see what I saw? <laughs> he just took off. What kind of question is that? So that's uh, uh, the final image of him on earth at that time. We all have an image of Jesus. And in Revelation 5, Jesus, John reveals what Jesus in heaven is like. We see even more depth into his glory, his majesty, which produces worship. This morning, I'd encourage you to take notes and even write down many, how many times I use these words if you don't want to write anything else. These keywords. When I started writing these keywords, I said, man, there's a lot of key words in this passage. Seven, worthy, worship, praise, even musical terms, lyric, stanza, doxology, poem, majesty, honor, and glory. You say, man, I'm already behind. He's used worship two or three times already, so just catch up. <laughs> so we're going to look at chapter 5 now. Let's read it. And you can turn there in your Bibles if you have them with you or on your device, or it'll also be up on the screen. Let's start with verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong voice... Uh, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was, worthy, was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne the, with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And he came and took the book out, out of my right hand, I'm sorry, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests, to our God, for they will reign upon earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, to be, uh, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow, what a powerful passage, huh? We're going to first look at uh, the first three verses in detail here. The chapter opens with John watching God on the throne. God then takes a book with his right hand, which we would also better be better described as scroll in his right hand. And we have a, a picture of that scroll, I think, uh, come up on the screen. And it's sealed with seven seals. 
the big question is, what is this book? What is this unique scroll or book? Uh, many uh, different commentaries uh, say different things. Uh, possibly the book of the new covenant. Possibly the book of redemption. The Lamb's book of life. The title deed to the earth. The scroll of judgments. And also, it's been theorized it could be the record of the sins of man. Uh, if it's a record of the sin of me, it better be a pretty big book. That's for sure. <laughs> the book or scroll is made of uh, parchment formed in, from papyrus, which was plentiful in, along the Nile River in Egypt. So that's how they had books and scrolls in those days. It was used to write up various contracts in, ancient, uh, in the ancient world, deeds, marriage contracts, rental agreements between parties, and also wills or last wills and testaments. I'm inclined to believe it's a title deed to the earth. I think this is going to be, uh, the things after this are going to be God's uh, claiming the earth in a final and dramatic and judgmental way. However, once the seal, however you believe, once the seals begin to be open in chapter 6, we do see judgment over and over and over unleashed upon the earth. In uh, Revelation chapter 6, the seals begin to be open. In chapter 8, the seventh seal contains seven trumpet judgments. And in chapter 16, the se seventh trumpet will contain seven bowl judgments. So it's kind of judgment after judgment after judgment. My point of view, uh, which is again not the gospel, is that these will all happen in a seven year period called the tribulation or the great tribulation. Okay, let's turn back to our passage now, chapters one, I'm sorry, verses one through three. In verse two and three, he says, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? No one in heaven and earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Uh, which angel is this? Who's this strong angel? Well, obviously no one knows for sure Possibly Gabriel, who's described uh, as strong uh, previously in his appearances in the Bible. And his name means, God is my strength. So it could very well be Gabriel. But the, whoever it is, he proclaims loudly, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? This is an extraordinary scroll. It's not a common agreement that's uh, known in the ancient world or contract. This scroll, this book, this agreement is very, very special. It's very unique. Since it is so unique, so important, there are special qualifications required just to open it. Uh, who is worthy is our question of the day. What about a nobleman? Could he open this book? No, he's not qualified. What about someone who's rich, has amazing wealth? No, not qualified. In today's world, I think we'd look at someone very popular, someone who's well-known to the masses or famous. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met anyone famous, but whoever they might be, uh, I've had the privilege of meeting a few people, but uh, nobody we know of, nobody how, however famous they are, are well known enough, are uh, special enough, or gifted enough, or qualified enough to open this scroll. This scroll is going to unleash a series of judgments against sin and sinners that has never before been seen, and no human has the qualifications to open it or to look into it. In verses 4 and 5, he says, Then I began to grieve, weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. John's uh, reaction to this news is overwhelming sorrow. And it's not just a slight tear coming down from his eyes. He is overwhelmed with his sorrow. He is weeping greatly, it says, because no one is found worthy to open the book. He's struck with the deep sadness that produces this great weeping. He's visibly shaken at this news. And I know all of us have 
uh, a lot of us in here have received tragic, sad news in our lives, and it does strike you to the core. And that's uh, John's very emotion. Uh, whether we've had pain, illness, uh, bad news, whatever's caused you and I uh, sorrow, we serve a God who comforts. And we see that comfort coming to John immediately. Uh, I want to read a passage from 2 Corinthians 1. You might be in a season of sorrow right now in your life, and I want you to take courage in this. This is 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings in Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. And we see this visibly happening to John. The... Uh, one of the elders comes up to him and immediately says, stop weeping. We've solved the problem. No matter the depth of our despair, God provides comfort and hope. Sometimes through his word, sometimes reading scripture on our own or in a group, sometimes through someone that comes along beside you and uh, has an encouraging word or prayer or a word from the Lord. And that's just what happens to John. One of the elders says, stop weeping, problem solved. Not, we got a guy, but we got a lion. Amens are welcome right now. <laughs> Does anyone else get chills? Or is it just me? I need my jacket instead of just this shirt. We got a lion, he says. And he's not from Detroit, by the way. With all respect to Eric. Eric. Uh, he is qualified. He meets God's stringent demands because he is perfect. He's lived a life of sinless perfection. His heritage qualifies him to be the Messiah, the Savior, the Promised One. And because he's the Messiah, he fulfills all, that God, all of God's requirements to open the scroll. In verses 6 and 7, John next describes what he sees. He says, uh, between the th uh, I saw between the throne and the four living, uh, with four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out to all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Between the throne and the elders, he sees a lamb standing. So we've seen Jesus described as a lion. Then immediately after that, he's described as a lamb. And it's not just an ordinary plain lamb, but one as if slain. He was the perfect lamb, and he was slain. I believe this is uh, John signifying that he sees Jesus' wounds, yet he's alive. He was fatally wounded, but yet he's alive because he's the risen lamb. This lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, now, horns signify power. We see him as a powerful lamb. And since seven is a complete and perfect number, this means that Jesus has perfect power. He has complete power, and he is the most powerful. He also says he has seven eyes. He sees everything. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Jesus sees and knows everything we're going through. We might feel like we're all alone when we're in distress or trial or tribulation, suffering problems. But Jesus is right there and he sees everything and he knows everything we're going on, that's going on with us. He also knows our weaknesses, our temptations and struggles. And uh, from Hebrews chapter 4, we understand that he is right there. He's been through it all. He can sympathize with us. He can carry us through whatever we uh, might have going on. He has the seven eyes. He's right there to carry us and strengthen us when we are weak. John's last uh, description of the Lamb is the seven spirits of God. And I believe this refull, refers to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Roger talked about that last week, that uh, the Holy Spirit is very vital in, uh, in our lives. And uh, Jesus is uh, a description of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
In Isaiah's messianic prophecy, we see this as being the Spirit of the Lord. The fullness of the deity will dwell within the Messiah. Uh, let's look at uh, the next slide, which is Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 2. I want to read that for us all. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Um, this is a messianic prophecy talking about the Messiah, the coming one, the Jesus that we're describing here in chapter 5. Uh, and uh, how is he perfect? Well, he uh, it, it fulfills everything God required. He and God are in unity. They are one in this. Count with me the uh, things there. We have the spirit of the Lord. We have the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. If I'm not incorrect in my Oklahoma math, that adds up to seven, doesn't it? And what we say? Seven is perfection, right? He's the perfect one. He's the perfect lion. He's the perfect lamb. He's the perfect one to open this scroll, this seal. He overcame death, and he's not just any lamb, he's the one that was slain. And he is living. He, though he was slain, he's still alive. This lion, this lamb, this Jesus that John is seeing is worthy. He's the one who is worthy. He's uniquely qualified to take the scroll and to open it up. He's to unleash the future. He is worthy to oversee the judgments of God, which follow in chapter 6 through 19. So however you might interpret that or read that as you look at that on your own, it might seem bad. There's a lot of bad things going on. Jesus is still there. He's still in control. Starting with verse 8, our text kind of changes. John shifts from describing the Lamb uh, to describing the response to the Lamb, those that are there. And this response is worship. We see in this section uh, the correct and proper response to an encounter with Jesus is worship. The correct, this, write this down, this million dollar phrase, the correct and proper response to an encounter with Jesus is to worship him. Part of the nature of worship is humility. We have to humble ourselves before him. That's the first step in worshiping. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every type, tribe and tongue, and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon earth. We see the reaction of those present who are surrounding the throne, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They fall down before the Lamb. This is a humble act of worship. How are you going to stand up against the Lamb? You're not. The only response is to be humble, to fall down before Him. When we're looking at God's Word, how do you read God's Word? Do you read it like, yeah, uh, Joe over there really needs this, or no, I need this. I humble myself before you, God. This is something I need to apply to my life. I need for you to work in my heart to change me. They are holding the harps and uh, bowls full of incense. These bowls of incense uh, were used twice uh, daily in the Old Testament ritual, in the uh, sacrificial uh, system they had in the Old Testament, the Jews had. Bowls of incense were used. Priests stood in front of the inner veil. The, the temple had an uh, outer court. Then you go inside where priests were allowed. Then uh, the inner sanctum was the Holy of Holies, much smaller. That's where the uh, Ark of the Covenant was kept. And uh, they burn incense at this door so that the smoke would carry through 
and go into the Holy of Holies and be swept into the very nostrils of God is what they believe. And that's what our prayers do. I don't know if you ever pray a prayer and think, man, it didn't get above the ceiling, but it did. If you're sincere in your prayers, God is hearing them and they are sweet incense to Him. He, he loves to hear our prayers. They are prayers of the saints and they, uh, by the prayers are uh, being an offering to Him, a sincere prayer recognizes His power. A sincere prayer recognizes His glory and it's a wonderful fragrance, fragrance to our Lord. You want to please God? One of the things you can do, pray to Him. Communication is very important, we realize, in friendships, in marriage, and it needs to be also in our spiritual life too. Communicate with God. Pray with Him. And He uh, sees that as a lovely fragrance. Next in verse 9, uh, the, uh, this is the most... Uh, I know there's been a lot of great songs written, and I'm a fan of a lot of songs... But uh, this is the most doctrinally sound, the most gospel-oriented, this is the right-to-the-point song you'll ever hear or sing. He says, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That's the gospel right there, isn't it? By His blood, we have the eternal salvation. And it's not just us, not just for uh, those in this room, those in this community, those who uh, are in America. Uh, it's, it's for everyone. This is a very gospel-oriented, doctrinally sound song. This continues a series of doxologies or songs that started in chapter 4, verse 8. And 11. And this continues throughout the rest of the book. I mean the rest of this chapter. Uh, it seems that when you see God and Christ as they really are, you're compelled to sing. Whether you have the ability to sing uh, like uh, beautiful uh, singers that we hear of all the time, or if you sing like me, pretty lousy, <laughs> it doesn't matter. God still is honored in our music. This song contains several profound truths. One, he is worthy. Secondly, he was slain. Third, he purchased and redeemed sinners for God. And then fourthly, how did he do that? He did that by his blood. This purchase was by a blood sacrifice. The most precious uh, gift ever. This redemption, this salvation, this gospel is for all mankind all races, every country, every continent. This is why Jesus commanded us in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Some of you might have been way ahead of me on that and realized that's what that was said. Everyone we meet, everyone we see and knows is one of two things. They're either Christian already, they're a believer in Christ already, or they what? They have that potential. Right? Everybody has the potential to become a Christian. Does knowing that change how you interact with others? Especially someone that cuts you off on the freeway? It's like, that's a potential Christian right there. <laughs> it had better change how we view others. We cannot decide who hears the gospel. We cannot say, oh, they're too far gone. Uh, can you imagine the... Uh, early Christians in Paul's era. He was dragging Christians out and beating them. He wanted to get rid of Christianity, the Apostle Paul. Yet, uh, God struck him down and changed his life. And then, of course, poor Ananias had to go there and talk to him. And he said, are you sure you want me to go, Lord? <laughs> are you sure you want me to talk to Paul? Uh, he's that guy that's our enemy. But everybody has the potential to change to become a Christian. So we need to view that every tribe every nation everyone all right let's move on to verses 11 and 12 
Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Next, John, John's attention is drawn to the angels that are in attendance at the throne. This sheer number was overwhelming. Uh, you might ask, how many was it? Well, uh, on the next clear night we have, go away from the city and drive out into the country somewhere and look up at the stars. That's how many there are. I, I know how many angels there are. The same as the number of st stars in the sky. Myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands is a way of saying beyond calculation. It's way, way more than uh, we know or can even imagine. There's... Uh, millions upon millions of angels. In uh, verse 12, uh, the angels also agree with this, that this precious, precious lamb is worthy. They list seven. Here's another seven qualities of the lamb that he happens to share with God the Father. Both have power. Both are the most powerful. Both have unmeasurable riches. Both have wisdom. Both are the wisest. Both have might. They have honor. They have glory. They have blessing. You see this in conjunction with God all the time throughout Scripture. The, the lamb and him are in sync. They're in one because they're both divine. These qualities demand our praise. They're so far above where we can be. Those, they're so far beyond what we can imagine. We have to do nothing but bow down and praise because they, in that act of uh, being slain, he did that for us. That was a sacrifice for us. While the previous doxology or verse was a praise to the Lamb's work, this verse is a praise for his deity, for his divine character. And uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, words there. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, might, honor, and glory, and blessing. All right, let's go ahead and look at verses 13 through 14 as we wrap things up this morning. I say that and we're going to go another half hour at least, so no, <laughs> cancel your lunch reservation. Uh, every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This completes our worship scene. This reminds me of Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read it for you. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in the heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everything that is, uh, every created thing is driven to express praise to him because things are about to return to the way they should be. God is ruling on his throne, Jesus beside him, and justice is going to be carried out in these series of judgments that follow. These judgments will usher in a new heaven and a new earth which will last forever. And sin, finally, will be done away with. No more pain, no more suffering, no more hurt, no more death. Uh, since Roger opened last week's sermon with a pop quiz, I'd like to have another teacher favorite. I'm going to assign you homework. <laughs> Let's hear the, all the yays. <laughs> uh, your homework this week is a take-home exercise to, you can do alone or with your family. I'd encourage you to talk to your family about it. And that's to write Jesus a praise song or a poem. And the best thing about it, put these lyrics down on paper, the best thing about it, it doesn't have to rhyme. Uh, these words don't rhyme, but they ring true, don't they? 
They're powerful words. So your words don't have to rhyme, but you can write him a praise song. From your heart, let your emotions go. Put your lyrics on paper, and then keep it in your Bible or at your desk. And then when you have a heavy burden or a crisis going on or your feelings of doubt or uh, struggling with something, pull out your poem and reread it or even add to it. Make, something, make a new verse at that time. We'd like to ask the praise team to come forward at this time. And as they're walking up, I'd like to kind of summarize. Revelation is a book of reality and of hope. It has the beautiful dynamic of telling us what's happening, what is going to happen, and all these awful things, but yet remain hopeful. It reveals rough things in the world, but we need to know that God is in control. He will reign with truth, justice, and righteousness. The last two Sundays, we've gotten a glimpse into heaven. And it's all beautiful and glory, and it's going to be an awesome place. It's going to be majestic. It's going to be beyond what we can even imagine. But there is one other eternal destiny. And I hate to say it, but that, that destiny is for those who do not know Christ as their Savior. And that's hell. If you're here today and you're not sure which is your eternal destiny, I'd encourage you to say yes to Jesus today. Yes to His love and forgiveness. And afterwards, if you've done that today or want to have uh, more explanation or any questions, come up afterwards and you can see me or Christian. If you're a Christ follower and you're really burdened by the effects of sin, our fallen sinful world, we do have hope. One day we'll all be free from the burden of sin and we'll be free from the presence of sin. We will have our forever home. You know, people, young people especially, uh, some of them say, I want to build my forever home when they go to the builder. We are going to have that, brothers and sisters. We are going to have a forever home and it's going to be full of glory and majesty because we'll be there with our Savior in all of His honor and glory and majesty. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious and wonderful Savior, we just thank you for the opportunity to look at your word today, for the truths contained therein. And I pray that we would uh, have a more realistic picture of heaven after this series. And we just thank you for the book of Revelation, for what it's taught us, what it reveals. And that is we have hope. You are in control. No matter what circumstance may bestow us, however burdened we may feel in our hearts and our lives, you're right there with us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your comfort that is supernatural and from on high that can go right to our very needs, right to our very hearts, and lift us up. We thank you for being part of this body who also can lift us up and encourage us, and uh, we can do that with one another, Lord. We thank you for that. Pray now as you, uh, we go on our day that you'd be with us, guide us, and lead us, teach us, Lord. We thank you for the blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
and rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only wise message this morning. Thank you for your previous message to uh, Roger and Buddy uh, and also Eric for being a part of this series. Uh, a unique uh, experiment for us, an opportunity for us to have different voices to be able to work together. Uh, each of these different uh, pastors, uh, we met together, we studied together, we laid out the series together, uh, and then each one of us to come and to uh, deliver a different message from the from these first five chapters of Revelation. And so I hope it's been a blessing to you. Uh, I know I've heard a lot of different people say they really appreciated this series, being able to hear the different voices. And so it's been a great series, but today was the last part of it. Next week, uh, we are going to uh, be kicking off our new church year. Technically, our new church year starts today. Uh, but with Labor Day, we have teenagers traveling. We have a lot of people uh, there on a retreat. We have a lot of people out of town. And so we will be officially kicking off our new church year next, next week. I'll be sharing next week with you our spiritual focus for the church year. Uh, we're also going to learn about some of the things that we have upcoming uh, in this church year for you to be excited about and to look forward to. Uh, next week, we're also going to be ordaining two new deacons. Uh, as a part of our service. And so uh, last, I think it was last week we had the election uh, for deacons and our two new deacons uh, on this rotation, adding to the rotation, uh, will be Brent Kovac and Jim Featherman. And so we're excited we're going to be ordaining them uh, next Sunday. Uh, and so it's going to be a great, great time next week. So make sure you... Uh, Come out for that. Be a part of that. Also kicking off next week 
is Kids Zone. It is back uh, for the new year, and so Kids Zone registration is open. It's free, but we really need to get kids registered so that we can have a better idea uh, what we need to be able to have uh, in place for supplies and things like that. And so uh, invite kids, neighbors, uh, relatives, friends to come out and be a part of that. Registration is open for Kids Zone, and it starts next Sunday. Uh, the teenagers, as I already mentioned, our teens uh, are uh, toward the coast. They're on the sound, but they're not near the beach. Uh, I, talked, uh, I was talking to McKenna about it this morning. And by the way, thank you to McKenna. Uh, she uh, is, is actually part of the retreat. She's down there leading uh, the teens with Eric. And uh, Kenzie drove down for a little bit and also Carl. Uh, but McKenna dro- woke up this morning about 5-something to drive back here to lead worship. Uh, and is going to turn back around and drive back to the coast when we're done. And so thank you very much for coming to be a part of leading us. But be praying for our teenagers. Pray for life change. Pray for the opportunity for them to come to faith uh, in Christ, those that are far from Christ, that they might know him. For those that are uh, going just like each of us, we all have our different faith journeys. So be praying for our teenagers. Uh, They're there uh, till tomorrow. Be praying for safe travel. They had they had quite the journey getting there. They, they drove right in the middle of that storm that we didn't know was coming, uh, and it hit right as they were supposed to be heading to the coast. And so they had to pull off, I think, twice uh, just because the, wet, the rain was so heavy. So praise God they made it safely, but be praying for their return tomorrow. And so those are the announcements that I have, uh, but I do want to introduce you to, uh, to some people. I'm going to ask if I can get Guy and Michelle Bayless, if you guys would come on up, and also Scott and Melissa Featherman, if you guys would make your way to the front. As they're making their way to the front, I want to introduce uh, them to you. This is uh, Guy and Michelle, and uh, Guy has been with us about a year, and uh, has been very excited about joining and becoming a member here at Bethany. Uh, Michelle has been with us a couple months. Uh, her job, her previous job, made it difficult for her to make it on Sunday. So Guy was coming, and he said, I'm just waiting for, for work to work out so Michelle can join me, and she can be a part of visiting the church. And she's been here now a couple of months. Uh, both love the church, and they said they're super excited about wanting to join with us in membership. And so Guy's also been an uh, active part of our men's ministry. So several of the men that are part of that ministry, you have already met uh, Guy and you've had the opportunity to get to know him. Highly encourage you get a chance to, uh, you take the chance to get to know Michelle, to get to know Guy. They're excited to become part of our church. And also over here to my far right, this is Scott Featherman and his wife, Melissa. They've been with us almost, I want to say it's a year and a half now. And so, and uh, about a year and a half, and uh, Scott has a job that requires quite a bit of travel uh, out internationally. So he's, he's constantly traveling uh, to different parts of the world for his job. But they have been a part of our church about a year and a half, love this church, have been super excited about joining. We've been talking about membership probably a good six months plus yeah, <laughs> and, and just absolutely loves this church. They want to get plugged in. Uh, they want to get uh, to be able to dive deeper into community and being able to, they're, they're a part of the uh, Rooted Small Group and just absolutely love being a part of this church family. And so I'm excited to be able to present two of these couples, both of these couples to you for membership this morning. What is your decision, church? All right. All those in favor... If you would both stand and raise your right hand. <laughs> all those opposed, you may, you may also raise your hand, but we're all standing. It's going to be hard to see you. So, <laughs> All right. Well, seeing that there are none, we are excited to welcome both of you guys to the family. Welcome. <laughs> And so I'm going to ask both of them, if they would, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind heading to the lobby and kind of hang out by the Connection Center, just kind of over here to the left along the wall. That way people can come by and welcome you to the church. Even on Labor Day weekend, listen, we vacation. The Lord doesn't. God is continuing to work even in our church family. And so what a tremendous day to be able to welcome new members to our church family. Please stop by, say hey to them on your way out. But let's close now with the singing of our doxology, Miss Serena.